noticed that I took those birds relatively early. Whether we're clay shooting or game shooting, I don't like to see birds being taken late because you can overbalance. Safe shooting is about developing the right attitude. The attitude which accepts that an accident can happen to you. I've been shooting for nearly 30 years, and I'm willing to admit that in that time I've made mistakes. We can all make mistakes. Once you can accept that, you're halfway to becoming a safe shot. Shooting's got an excellent safety record. Indeed, statistically, shooting's safer than fishing or football. But the reason that shooting is a safe sport is because all of us involved in it take safety very seriously indeed. I take pride and care in all my gun handling. I do that because I get a satisfaction from it, and also because I think those habits are infectious to other people. Safe gun handling is mainly applied common sense. Here are 10 basic points, and they start with the golden rule. Don't point your gun at something you're not willing to kill. Remember the words of the old poem, Never, never let your gun pointed be at anyone. All the pheasants ever bred won't undo one man dead. Never point your gun at something you're unwilling to destroy. The fact that you know it's unloaded is immaterial. People get killed every year with empty guns. A closed shotgun is always treated as if it was loaded. You've got to develop muzzle awareness always knowing where your gun is pointing. It's the first and last line of defense against shooting accidents. Point two, always check that a gun is unloaded and unobstructed when you pick it up, when it's passed to you, or when you pass it to someone else. It's all too easy to miss that one has left a cartridge in a gun or accidentally allowed something to block the barrels. Shooters must be aware of this and constantly guard against it. When you pick up a semi-automatic or pump-action gun, or when you pass a repeater to someone else, make sure that you not only check that the chamber's empty, but check the magazine tube too. Point three, never shoot at a target unless you've clearly identified it first. Always be sure of your target. If you're game shooting, get to know your birds. Point four, before loading a gun, one should always check to see that there are no obstructions. Guns can blow up because of mud or snow in the barrels, or because something has been accidentally dropped into them. The classic accident involves accidentally inserting a 20-bore cartridge into a 12-bore chamber, and then loading a 12-bore shell on top. This is the result. Point five. When you're not shooting or about to shoot, your gun's action should be open and unloaded. When you carry your gun at a clay shoot, you should do so with the action broken, or in the case of repeaters, with the action locked back. Break action guns should be carried barrels forward and resting on your forearm. That's the best way. You can also carry a break action gun on your shoulder with the barrels pointing forward and secured with one hand. But then you must be very careful that you know where the butt of the gun is and that you don't accidentally hit someone with it. In the case of repeaters, you can carry them pointing 45 degrees into the ground underneath your arm, or you can carry them pointing with the barrels straight up in the air, and that's the best way to carry a repeater. I also like to see a safety plug in a repeater when it's being carried from stand to stand. This shows everyone else that the gun is unloaded. Point six. The only time when a gun can be loaded and closed is when one's shooting or about to shoot. When clay shooting, one goes to the firing point with an open, empty gun, and one leaves the firing point having checked the gun is in the same state. It's important that you do that before you turn around to leave. Point seven. When you close a gun, do so under control and with the muzzles pointing into the ground. You'll have noticed then that I kept my finger on the trigger guard. It's also permissible to have it on the stock here, but not on the trigger. 
I prefer to close a gun with the stock located between my tummy and my forearm. I feel I've got more control then. The weight comes onto my front foot, I push up with the front hand and down with the back hand. The traditional way of closing a gun is like this. That's perfectly permissible, but the danger is with beginners that the gun can rotate about the axis of the front hand and end up pointing at their feet. As far as the semi-automatic is concerned, the principles are exactly the same. Make sure that when you close the gun, that it's pointing at 45 degrees into the ground. That way, if the impossible should happen and it should go off, it'll go off harmlessly into the ground and no one will be hurt. Point eight, make sure that the gun you're using is in serviceable condition and in proof. We'll go into this in more detail later. Point nine, only use cartridges in a gun which are suitable for it. Suitable in this context means cartridges which correspond to the proof marks on the gun. Most shotguns sold in the UK today have been proof for use with two and three quarter inch 70 millimeter shells. However, many older guns haven't. The old standard was two and a half inches, 65 millimeters. Modern two and three quarter inch cartridges will fit into a two and a half inch chamber, but if fired, they're dangerous. You also want to look out for very old guns which have only been proof for black powder. If you fire a modern nitro cartridge in a gun which has been proved for black powder only, it can blow up. This is what an incorrectly loaded cartridge can do to your gun. Pretty worrying, isn't it? And finally, point 10. Don't drink or fool around when you're shooting. Now I know that some game shots like to have a drink at lunchtime or take a swig from a hip flask between drives. Not me. I don't think that drinking and shooting mix. Generally, with all the points that we've discussed, take care and pride in all your gun handling. Be an example to other people. The same discipline and control which makes you a safe shot will also make you a better shot. Here are some other points in a little bit more detail. We're on a clay shooting layout now, and I just want to go through a few points of safety with clay shooting. First, you'll note that I've arrived with the gun in a slip and with the muzzles pointing down. Whether we'd been game shooting or clay shooting, it's always a good idea to get the gun into a slip when you're not using it. The reason that we have the gun pointing muzzles down is that in case we haven't fastened the slip properly, the gun doesn't drop into the mud. When I take the gun out of the slip, I remember the golden rule of shooting. Never point the gun at something you're not willing to destroy. And as I take the gun out, my finger is on the trigger guard and I actually break the gun before I remove it from the slip. As I take it from the slip, I check that it's unloaded and unobstructed. It would have been perfectly permissible for me to have arrived on the shooting stand with the gun resting on my forearm like that, or on the shoulder, barrels pointing forward, secured with one hand. Although this latter method is not quite as good as this way for the simple reason that you can knock people with the stock if you carry the gun on your shoulder. Okay, now that we're on the position, the first thing that we want to do is to have a look at the target. Pull! Fine, I'm happy with that. The point is that just because we're clay shooting, don't assume automatically that it's safe to shoot. Ultimately, the decision on whether you shoot or not is always down to you. The next thing I'm going to do is to put my hearing and eye protection on. I've set up my foot position to suit this particular target, and now I can load the gun under control. No obstructions. Cartridge goes in, gun is closed under control, and I've still got the safety catch on. Some people will take the safety catch off at this point when they're clay shooting. Indeed, some people actually have their guns modified so that the safety catch doesn't operate at all. That's acceptable for clay shooting, but my personal preference is to have a 
safety catch and to remove it only when the gun is pointing skywards. So I'm now ready to shoot this target. No problems. I'll try a pair on report now. Pole! You'll have noticed that I took those birds relatively early. Whether we're clay shooting or game shooting, I don't like to see birds being taken late because you can overbalance. Fine, we're finished shooting now. I check to make sure that the gun is unloaded, unobstructed, and I could walk off the firing point carrying the gun like that. But because it's a slightly windy and wet day, I've decided the safest place for the gun is in the slip. So, fine. All safe and sound in the slip, and back onto my shoulder, muzzles pointing down. We're going to consider game shooting now, and perhaps the first point to be made is the first point that we made at the beginning of the program. Always beware of where you're pointing your gun. Never shoot at something when you can't see clearly what it is. The use of the safety catch is particularly important when we're game shooting. The safety catch should remain on until you've actually identified the target and you're in the process of mounting the gun to it. Here are some other specific points on rough shooting. A situation you'll commonly come up against when you're rough shooting is crossing obstacles. You must never cross an obstacle with a gun in your hands. The proper procedure, if there's one person, is this. Check that the gun is open and unloaded. Place it carefully on the other side of the obstacle, making sure that you don't push it into the mud or into snow. And then having placed it on the ground, negotiate the obstacle yourself. Pick your gun up, check that it's still unobstructed, and go about your business. If there are two of you, the procedure is this. One person should take both guns. Thank you. The other person should then negotiate the obstacle. The guns are passed to them. The obstacle's crossed, and we go on about our shooting. Many of the potential dangers when we're rough shooting emanate from the fact that we're on the move. When you walk with the gun, you can do so with the muzzles pointing down or with the muzzles pointing skywards. Safety catch on, of course. You must be particularly careful where you're pointing the gun, especially when you're walking with a companion. Ernest and I are now going to walk up this section of woods to the right. You'll notice that at this point, my gun is unloaded. Even though the adrenaline may be pumping, you've got to resist the temptation to load the gun. I come up into position. Now I can load. Before I close the gun, I check that Ernest is in position. And now I can move. Adrenaline can always be a problem when we're shooting, particularly when we're rough shooting and particularly when we're engaging ground targets. Be very, very careful with ground game. Identify the target and identify what's behind it before you shoot. Much better that you hesitate and lose the shot than shoot another human being or an animal that you didn't wish to shoot. 
Much the same applies to situations where you're dealing with low flying birds. Low birds are always potentially dangerous. Never be tempted into leaning your gun up against a tree like that. Or indeed doing the same thing inside a pigeon shooting hide. It's a certain recipe for an accident. We're going to look at driven game shooting now. And the first thing that I'm concerned by when I arrive at my peg is what the ground's like. If it helps to stamp it down a bit to give me a better footing, that's the first thing I'm going to do. Then I'm going to look to see the position of the other guns. Normally they'd be spaced about 40 yards apart. I've made sure that I've brought plenty of cartridges and I've walked onto the peg with my gun in a slip. I can take the gun out now, and as always, I'm careful where I'm pointing it. I make sure that my finger's along the trigger guard, and I open the gun before I remove it from the slip. I check that it's unloaded and unobstructed. One of the things you've got to be particularly careful of when you're game shooting, when you're driven game shooting, is that you don't allow your gun to swing through the line. In other words, you don't allow your gun to point either to the left or to the right at your fellow shooters. The gun should always be unloaded, except during the drive itself. You must find out what the start and finish signal is for the drive. Usually it'll be a whistle or a horn. Don't load your gun early. As with all game shooting, when we're driven shooting, the safety catch should be on until we're actually bringing the gun up to an identified target. As we see the target, the muzzles come to it, the safety comes off, the gun comes into the shoulder, and we fire. When we're waiting for the birds to come over us, there are various acceptable ways to stand. You can put the butt sole of the gun onto your hip bone like that. Notice the finger is extended along the trigger guard. The safety catch, of course, is on. And as something happens, I can just drop the gun into the other hand and bring it up to the face and shoulder. That's a perfectly adequate way to stand. If you prefer, you can adopt a more alert position, holding the gun with both hands like this. Naturally, what tends to happen is that one begins in a position like that, and then when there's a sign of activity, the gun instinctively drops into the other hand. You must be constantly alert when you're shooting driven game. Be particularly careful about beaters coming forward. Never shoot a bird low in front. Sometimes in driven shooting, it'll be permissible to take a bird behind the line. You should find out first, though, if this practice is acceptable at the shoot briefing. If it is, and you do take a bird behind the line, as you turn, make sure your muzzles are pointing well up. Another point on driven shoots is that often it is not acceptable to shoot at ground game. If you've got any doubts, ask at the shoot briefing before the shoot itself starts. When game shooting, keep still whenever possible and don't be tempted to move your position. As always when you're shooting, don't get overexcited. It's when people allow their heart to start pounding and the adrenaline to take over that accidents can happen. When the final whistle or horn goes, immediately break your gun unload, check for obstructions, and put the gun back into the slip. You should always have the gun in the slip when you move from drive to drive.
The one sort of shooting that we haven't mentioned yet is wild fowling. Like driven shooting, it's a huge subject, and all the details go beyond the scope of this short programme. There are a few points worth noting, though. Pellets can ricochet off water. When you're shooting at a flight pond, never allow guns to face each other. Vitally important, when you're shooting on the foreshore, learn to read the tide tables. Take a wading stick with you so you can avoid mud holes, and also put a compass in your pocket. Remember that all the basic rules of gun handling that we've discussed are as applicable in the home as on the shooting field. Unfortunately, there are quite a few accidents at home, particularly when people are cleaning guns which they think are unloaded. You've also got to be careful about the security of your guns. Obviously, you should keep them locked up and away from little fingers and little eyes. Kids have a fascination for guns. And by the by, one way to get round that is to introduce your children properly to shooting at an early age. Getting into the habit of safe gun handling at an early age is a great advantage. That doesn't mean, though, that adults can't do it. If you've got any problems or any doubts, seek out the opinion and the help of a shooting instructor, or come on one of the many courses which are now offered by organizations like the British Field Sports Society to improve your shooting technique. My final comment on gun safety is this. Take care and pride in all your gun handling. Be an example to others. If you see someone handling a gun improperly, don't be afraid to tell them. And remember the golden rule, never, never let your gun pointed be at anyone. We've talked about some of the basics of safe gun handling, but there's another important safety related subject, personal protection, protecting your hearing and protecting your eyes. You must wear some sort of hearing protection when you're shooting, whether you're clay shooting or game shooting. If you don't, you'll go deaf or you'll develop tinnitus, constant ringing in the ears. There's a lot of choice today. You can get a pair of excellent electronic muffs like these, a pair of simple muffs like these, or there are a variety of different types of earplug. I actually prefer these cheap little plugs made of a spongy plastic material which you can knead and put into your ear canals. You can also buy, or rather have made for you, this type of plug, which are personally moulded to the shape of your ear. On the subject of eye protection, it is prudent to wear eye protection, particularly when you're clay shooting. They prevent stray bits of clay coming into your eyes. When you're shopping for glasses, make sure that they've got impact resistant lenses. And of course, you can buy a variety of tints. Everyone who shoots should have a good pair of sunglasses. And you may find, if you're a clay shot, that yellow tints or red tints can be a help to you too. We're in a gun shop now, and we're going to consider the important subject of gun condition. It may be that you want to know what sort of condition your own gun is in, or you might be thinking about buying a gun. Now, perhaps I should preface anything I say with this advice. If you've got any doubts about a gun, find a gunsmith and ask him for his opinion, because it really is a very complex business, assessing gun condition definitively. I've got a Browning 20 bore in my hands. Let's have a look at it. Now, the first thing that I note with this gun is that it's new. So, obviously, I'm not going to expect much to be wrong with it, particularly from a well-known maker like Browning. But let's go through the motions anyway. I'll close the gun. Can I feel any vibration? No, the gun's closing well, a little stiff because it's new. What about the top lever? Is it coming back into position? Is it well sprung? No problems here. You'll notice that the top lever is very slightly off to one side, and that's perfectly acceptable. We'll take the fore end off now. And we'll just see if there's any sign of looseness in the action. And I can tell you now there won't be, because the gun is new and it's stiff as I've already noted. But in an old gun, you might notice that there's a degree of rattle. In gunsmithing terms, we would say that the gun was off the face. That is, the joint between the face of the barrels and the face of the action isn't adequate. 
It may also be the case that there's wear, either on the bearing surface here or on what we call the cross pin. Let's have a look at the barrels themselves. Again, the first thing that strikes me is that there's good deep bluing, and being a new gun, it's in perfect condition. More importantly, though, on the other side, here are the proof marks. 15.8, that's 15.8 millimeters, which is the metric bore size of a 20 bore. NP, nitro proof, 1200, that's 1200 bar, which is the proof pressure testing, and 1200 indicates that the gun's been proofed as a magnum. LP over 93, that's London proof 1993. I also see from the maker's markings on the barrels that the gun has been chambered for both two and three quarter inch and three inch shells. That of course corresponds to the 1200 bar marking, which confirms the manufacturer's marking. The next thing I'm going to do is not just look at the barrels very carefully, although of course our eyes are an invaluable aid to assessing gun condition, but I'm also going to feel them. I'm going to run the barrels between my fingertips like that. And it's amazing how well your fingertips can pick up any little imperfection in the barrels. It's an excellent way of finding out, for example, if the barrel's been dented. The next thing I'm going to do is to have a look at the barrels internally and externally. I rest them on my front hand like that, and keeping the front hand still, I rock them, casting a light, or rather a shadow, down the outside surface of the barrels. I'm also going to look inside, again keeping the front hand still, and rotating my rear hand. Again, casting a shadow through the barrels. I'm looking at the chambers, and on older guns, one often sees chambers that have been pitted or rusted up. I'm looking at the forcing cones. That's the funnel-like constriction that leads the shot charge into the main bore. And in front of the forcing cones in this area here, which is an area which is particularly liable to get pitted in older guns. No problems at all. Turn the barrels around and have a look from the muzzle end. I'm going to pay particular attention here to the area just behind the chokes. Because again, in older guns, that area does tend to get pitted. It's, that's not to say that I'm not looking all through the barrels, because I am. But I always pay particular attention to this area behind the chokes and to this area in front of the forcing cones. Now this gun's got multi-chokes in, and obviously I take those out and examine them as well. One thing that you want to look for in multi-choke guns is to make sure that the multi-chokes are in fact concentric with the barrel bores. Just about perfect. Should you discover that the gun is not properly proofed, or that the barrels are damaged, put it away. Don't be tempted into using it. I might particularly note that if you use a gun that's got even a tiny dent in the barrels, you can end up further damaging them. You can create a ring bulge next to the dent. And of course, the pressures inside the gun can also be raised dangerously. So if there's any question mark at all, and if you have any queries, do seek out a gunsmith. But if you pick up anything yourself, don't use the gun. Put it away. Now I'm going to look at the action again. And to do that, I'm going to reassemble the gun. And you'll notice that as I'm doing this, I'm still maintaining control of the gun. Just because we're at home or in a gun shop doesn't mean that we shouldn't be applying all the basic principles of gun safety to our gun handling. Fine. The gun's now together. And the first thing I'm going to look at is the function of the safety catch. I've got some snap caps here. Let's put those into the gun. Close the gun under control, apply the safety catch, try and pull the trigger. 
Fine, that seems to be functioning. And that's what I'm looking for, functioning on the safety catch. I'll remove the safety catch. Splendid. Now, this is a recoil activated single trigger mechanism. So, to be able to pull the trigger again, I'm going to have to hit the back of the stock. Not quite hard enough. That's enough. There. Now we've fired both barrels. And I'm going to open the gun. Notice that I put my hand over the chambers to catch the snap caps. Fine. Well, that has told me that the safety catch is operational and that also the ejectors operate. Ideally, to test the ejectors, I probably have a pair of aluminium or plastic snap caps and I'd open the gun slowly and I'd see that both, both ejectors operate simultaneously and that as the two spent snap caps come out, that they're roughly together in the air. That's called the timing of the ejectors, but it's getting a bit complicated for the level of things that we've got here. Fine. The next thing that I want to do is to check the trigger selector mechanism. Again, I'll load some snap caps, close the gun under control, and change over now for it to fire the top barrel first. And carefully pointing the gun at the ground, there's one. Hit the stock again to activate the recoil mechanism. Not hard enough. Takes quite a lot of force. There we are. Fine. No problems there. As I was doing that, I was also feeling the trigger. What you want is a trigger that's got no cre creep in it, and it has a crisp pull. If you get a gun with very light trigger pulls or very heavy trigger pulls, it can be dangerous. Particularly very light trigger pulls are dangerous when you're game shooting. The last thing you want is a gun which goes off prematurely. Now this gun, it's a side-by-side -side game gun, has an automatic safety catch. By that I mean this, watch. I'll close the gun under control, remove the safety catch, and when I operate the top lever, the safety catch comes on automatically. Fine. So, we've looked at the condition of the action. We've looked at the trigger pulls, the safety catch, the functioning of the top lever, crucially important, the barrels. Now let's think about the woodwork. Gun stocks can crack and there's some places where they're particularly likely to crack. Anywhere, for example, where metal meets wood. On the top strap, to the rear of the top strap here, and especially at the head of the stock. Now I've got a stock here which I've taken off another gun, and you'll see why gun stocks are particularly prone to crack at the head because the wood's relatively thin at this point. It's been carved out to fit it to the gun's action. So this area here you want to look very carefully at. To the rear of the top strap, here, and also here, and here. On the fore end, it's much the same thing. Be particularly careful of wherever wood meets metal. So you want to look at this area here, here, and also anywhere where something has been inletted into the forend. Another common place for a crack in forends is right at the front. Another point about the action is the condition of the action face itself and most importantly of the strikers, the firing pins. You want to make sure that the firing pins are neither chipped 
or mushroom. You can see them now. There they are. And these ones look as if they're in excellent condition, as we'd expect with a new gun. On the subject of misfires, if you're ever out shooting, and this should happen, click instead of bang, don't immediately open the gun. It's just possible that the problem wasn't a defect in the action, but a faulty cartridge. And one potentially dangerous fault in a cartridge is a hang fire. That's a delayed ignition of the propellant powder. If you were to immediately open the gun, it could fire back into your face. Control the gun, point it towards the ground, wait 30 seconds, direct it away from your face, and then open it. Just a few words on older guns, and particularly on Damascus barrels and sleeved barrels. Damascus steel, and it's a beautiful thing to see, predates modern fluid pressed steel. And in fact, what it is, is metal that's been twisted in strands and then wrapped around a mandrel. Now, characteristically, with Damascus steel, you have a beautiful brown pattern, which is brought out by a chemical process which involves literally browning the barrels rather than conventional blue or black barrels. The reason for Damascus steel was that in the days when there were impurities in metal, by having this system of wrapping strands together and then bringing them together again around a mandrel, if the barrels actually failed, they tended just to expand out. They didn't blow up. It actually gave a little bit of leeway for faults in the metal. Beautiful stuff, but the problem with Damascus steel is that it's not as strong as modern steel, and that many Damascus barrel guns are not suited to modern cartridges. On this old single-barreled gun, you may just be able to see BP there, black powder proof. Black powder predates modern nitro smokeless powder, and the pressures involved are vastly reduced compared to a modern cartridge. If you put a modern nitro cartridge into a Damascus barrel, it may well blow up. That said, it is possible to bite the bullet and send a beautiful old Damascus barreled gun to the proof house, probably via a gunsmith, and get it reproved for modern nitro cartridges. You bite the bullet then because it may blow up in the proofing process. Nevertheless, a joy to behold Damascus steel. And there's more than one famous shot who actually preferred the shooting qualities of Damascus steel. Lord Walsingham thought that it rang less than conventional steel, for example. On the subject of sleeved barrels now, just a couple of points worth mentioning. Many older double barreled guns have been re sleeved. The telltale signs of a sleeved gun are a join here. Because when you sleeve a gun, you literally cut the barrel tubes off at about this point and insert two new barrel tubes. You reuse the old rib, and of course, all the ejector work and the lumps can still be used, so it's much cheaper than rebarreling. On very elderly sleeve guns, you'll often see the word sleeved at this point on the barrels. On more modern guns, the sleeving mark, the proof mark, is on the barrel flats here. But as I said, you want to look out for the telltale join between the new tube and the old breech assembly. Now, the thing about sleeving is that if it's properly done, it's an excellent way of restoring an old gun. But it does drastically reduce the value of the gun. Another point to beware of, particularly on old Damascus guns, is that you may occasionally see a Damascus barreled gun that's been blued or blacked rather than properly browned. And the reason that that's done sometimes is to disguise the fact that the barrel's made of Damascus steel. Not so common today,
because there are a lot of people like me that actually love to see Damascus steel. But a few years ago, it was quite common to black over it, and it gives the impression of being a, conventionally, a conventional barrel. Beware of that. And indeed, beware of all the pitfalls of buying a second-hand car when you buy a second-hand gun. Guns can be dressed up to look very, very different from their actual state, their mechanical state. Don't just think because a gun looks pretty that it's in good condition. We've looked at some of the basics of assessing gun condition in this program, but remember, it takes years of experience and specialist equipment to definitively test gun condition. This is a bore micrometer which a gunsmith would use to measure the wear inside the barrels. He might also have a piece of equipment called a wall thickness gauge, which measures the meat that's left in the barrels, the actual wall thickness of the barrels. Generally, on the subject of gun condition and of the subject of gun handling, expect the unexpected. I was on a game shoot recently, loading for somebody, and I noticed this. Their gun opened, and only the rim of the cartridge was ejected. What had happened was that the cartridge had appeared to go off normally, but part of the case had lodged itself just in front of the chamber, much like the classic accident involving a 20-bore shell inadvertently being put in a 12-bore with the 12-bore cartridge loaded on top of it. Luckily, I spotted something was wrong, and nobody loaded another cartridge in there. But it could have been a very nasty accident, and it was a very, very unusual occurrence. Be careful. Remember that shotguns are dangerous out to 300 yards, and treat them with respect. Never point a gun at something you're not willing to kill. All this safety business really is important. This is the result of getting it wrong. Safe shooting 